David Rosen. David, as you have this call, is our principal investigator of the project. He's also a professor of music and director of taught postgraduate studies at the Open University. David's research is on the performance history of repertoire of the piano and the relationship of music and commerce in the 18th and 19th centuries, particularly focusing on Clementi and Fisher. Thanks very much, David. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you very much. Um, so, just so like these briefly to start, I first want to start here this morning. Uh, it was my only job to get to the hospital for a checkup after a second operation. Um, so, that becomes the second apology, which is if you want to get that checkup, they put all sorts of things in your eyes, uh, which means that I can't now read very much. So, if I have to pay my visitor in the course of the day, you'll know what's happening. Um, this is on. Listening constraints in the Jewish provinces, uh, circa 1750 to 1800. Um, <clears throat> my real introduction is worth saying that London was undoubtedly the most important centre of music making in England in the second, second half of the 18th century. <coughs> and its success was due to a number of factors. All the major institutions were based there, including the court, the government, the judiciary, and to a large extent the church. It was an important trading centre by land and by sea, and the city's population was more than ten times the size of its nearest rivals. Crucially for music, London's large population was cultured and relatively wealthy, so it's no wonder they had a thriving musical life. <clears throat> Outside of the capital, capital, the situation was less rosy. Fast expanding cities such as Manchester, Birmingham and Liverpool were based on commerce, and their cultural institutions were largely underdeveloped in the 18th century. By comparison, the more traditional centres of culture and learning, such as the older cathedral and university cities, had not seen comparable population growth, so they were unable to support major performance venues or to attract the best musicians, except perhaps during the summer when London society and its musicians tipped out into the country. So what was the musical experience of listeners in the provinces? In particular, what were the major constraints on their listening, and how did those constraints affect their experience of music? At last year's symposium, I talked about the occasions on which music was performed in the provinces, such as Assizes Court Visits, the Races, Subscription Concert Series, and so on. I also talked about the performers themselves, as well as their audiences. And today I'm just going to concentrate on three specific issues. <coughs> so, there they are. The repertoire that musicians, listeners in the provinces heard and knew. Secondly, how musicians actually engaged with that music. And thirdly, the quality of performances. Like last year, many of my observations are going to be based on the experiences of Thomas Twyne. Uh, I spoke last year about his correspondence. It's an incredibly rich source of information for uh, music, especially in the Colchester area. Uh, I've since revisited it and will revisit, revisit it again uh, because of its richness, uh, just asking different questions each time we go back to it. So an introduction to Thomas Twining. Thomas Twining was the grandson of his namesake who founded the tea and coffee business. The founder of the firm passed the business into the hands of his son, who in turn began to groom the younger Thomas, our Thomas, um, to follow in his footsteps. This Thomas, remember, that is, the our Thomas, the grandson of the founder, uh, turned out to be useless at business. And instead, he was said to be educated in Cambridge and then into the church. Now, most of his life was spent in the Colchester area and its surrounding villages. He travelled a little, including occasional trips to London, Cambridge, and a few other parts of England and Wales. But his musical experience was mostly confined to performances in the Colchester and Ipswich areas. <clears throat> his letters date from the 1760s onwards and were written to family, Cambridge friends, and acquaintances in London, notably Charles Burney, with whom he had an extensive correspondence. <clears throat> First question then <clears throat> what repertoire did Twain know? I think the, one of the reasons I selected uh, that as a question to address today is because the answer to it illustrates a great deal about the circulation of music in the late 19th century, and therefore the experience of listeners during the period. Many provincial, provincial listeners were familiar 
with a smaller and much more conservative repertoire than their London counterparts. We know this from diaries, letters from many people. Um, but Thomas Twain's experience wasn't actually quite like that. He speaks of his familiarity with many recent publications from London and further afield in Europe. He also writes at length on music by 16th and 17th century composers. And his knowledge, I think, of music would have been much more extensive than many listeners of his social status in London or anywhere else at the time. So the question arises, how did Twining encounter all of this repertoire? And the answer is through a variety of channels. Obtaining music scores was not straightforward for provincial musicians in the 18th century. In London, there were well over 30 music shops in the second half of the 18th century, and the larger ones among them made and sold instruments, they published their own editions, and obtained scores from other parts of England and Europe. After London, Edinburgh and Dublin were best served by music shops. Beyond that, some towns such as cities like Cambridge had music shops where locally engraved music was sold. But in the majority of towns, if music was available at all, uh, it was through bookshops who sold very selective titles. But the crucial thing is that they didn't do their own engraving. So what they had available had to be bought in from elsewhere, and it was very limited in the year. Such bookshops existed in both Colchester and Ipswich. Um, but for the sort of repertoire in which Twining was interested, he would have had to go at least to Cambridge, or more probably to London, where he visited music shops. And here's a fairly early uh, letter that he wrote of his account uh, of visiting a music shop in London. I have met with some fine cantatas in the Scarlatti style by great masters. Two of the Baron d'Astorga, one of Marc Antonio Bonaccini, one of Handel's, one of Marcello, and one of Antonio Lotti. You would have laughed to see me buy these. Where did I buy them of all places but of Walsh's music shop? He found out my taste and flung a whole bundle of, his, of the manuscript music before me. He didn't say, indeed, you should have this, but I said so for my, myself, for him. And so he got the money out of my pocket as easily as if I had been a lady of quality and had come in a coach. <clears throat> in addition to occasional visits to music shops, and they were very occasional because Twain hardly ever went to London, uh, he would have been informed about the latest musical publications by reading newspaper advertisements. These appeared mostly in the London press, although occasionally adverts in the 18th century would appear in provincial newspapers. Provincial newspapers having uh, begun to get into circulation right at the beginning of the century and quickly gained ground, but they didn't have many music adverts. We know that London newspapers were circulated around the country, and Twining occasionally writes of details that he picked up from them. Just a couple of brief instances here. First of all, in a letter to Bernie, what makes me more anxious to have some time to be born is that I find you've had a fire in your street. I saw it a day or two ago in a newspaper. <clears throat> And then secondly, I have just been frightened out of my wits by hearing it mentioned upon the authority of a newspaper that your house has been broke open and robbed to a considerable amount. It was one of, the, one of Bernie's previous servants, just in case you wonder. Um, so if, if, he, if Twining read these sort of details in the London press, I think we can probably safely assume that he also looked out for adverts of new music, although I have no proof of that. So after that information about the latest publications, we might imagine that it was a fairly simple matter for a provincial musician such as Twining to request delivery of scores to his home. After all, the letter post was, uh, was well up and running. Uh, it wouldn't have cost him too much to send a letter to one of the music publishers to say, please send me a package with this music in it. However, there was no national parcel post, and as far as I can see, uh, music didn't really travel by the letter post. Parcel post in England came into being as late as 1883. And prior to that, parcels were delivered around the country by private carriers. Uh, but the point is that the process was far too complex for the music shops to offer it as a service. Twain had a way around this because being part of the tea and coffee business, his family had wagons that went around the country. So some of his parcels came that way. Um, but he also uh, had access to other private carriers that occasionally he asked to send music to him from a contact in London. 
So Twining was able to get some of the latest publications by various means, but he also had other means of expanding his library. He was part of a network of educated gentlemen whose libraries he raided on a regular basis. Sometimes this happened during a visit, and sometimes he requested scores by correspondence. By the way, he employed the services of copyists to obtain a good amount of early music as well as 18th century Italian opera scores. So, through music shops and the libraries of friends and acquaintances, Twining gradually put together a substantial library. Um, and I've got a couple of quotes just to illustrate a point from his letters. There are many such quotes about how he came across all this material. So, the first one to a friend of his, um, Cambridge academic John Payne. 1762. He says, there's a Dr. Woodward, a physician at Bristol, who plays the fiddle and has really notions about music. I don't know how he performs, or he's not yet been able to find some time for a sonata, but he has some very fine music, and of the sort which I'm looking after. He has led me three more cantatas of Pagalism, with full liberty of copying. He has led me, besides, an entire mass by the same master, for five voices with instruments. This, you may suppose, is a great treat to me, having never seen anything of Pagalazes in the full church style. There are solos and duets in it. I won't tell you how fine it is. You shall see some time or other, for I will be at the expense of a copy, though I bring myself to the workhouse for it. And then a different uh, kind of account, the second one in a letter to Bernie, 1775, just says, This parcel arrived safe last night. How good of you, how good of you to send me these concertos. I have an eager, craving appetite about me for that man's music, but I never felt that any other, and it's very clear from the context that he's talking about C.P. Clark's uh, music. One other brief quote, not, not this time about Twining receiving music, but about him obtaining music for somebody else. Again, to Bernie, I find Miss Forster has a sweet voice and an excellent ear. I wish you had her under your tuition. Such scholars must be comfortable and refreshing. I have procured for her a set of lessons I have lately met with by one grocer. Uh, we don't know how he met with those lessons, but he was writing from Colchester, uh, so maybe so it would have to apply to maybe a friend part of the world. So in summary, provincial musicians faced many obstacles in constructing a wide-ranging library of sources of scores. But some of ingenuity, like Toyning, could nevertheless accumulate an impressive collection if they were persistent and particularly important if they were well connected. So what's the second question then? How did Twining engage with the music collected? <coughs> How did he listen to it? Well, there were major constraints here because of performing forces that he had available. Now, Peter Holman has documented some of Cortester's music making in the 18th century, and it's clear from his account uh, in early music in 2000, and from Twining's letters, that there were as many opportunities to hear music in Colchester as in most established towns and cities in England. There were private and public concerts at which concertos and chamber music were played, as well as smaller gatherings at which friends played to each other. And the contents of the local orchestral library suggests that it was possible to put together an orchestra, and not just with strings and a few woodwinds, but actually quite an expanded band with uh, quite a lot of wind instruments and trumpets and drums, the latter probably played by the local militia. So, Twining had good opportunities at his disposal, but nevertheless, there were some constraints. Um, here's a letter again to Bernie uh, in 1781, where he's discussing Boccherini, who he described as my first favorite. I know two or three sets of his quartet as well, but the impossibility of getting his quintets done, even tolerably in the country, had prevented my knowing or meeting with them. That's a minor irritation. I think Twining must have had much, much bigger irritations. For example, the fact that it was not really possible for him to hear opera in Colchester or the surrounding area. Neither was it possible, as far as we can tell, for him to hear all this uh, 16th, 17th century church music that I referred to and that we discussed. Um, Colchester simply didn't have the resources to perform those sort of repertoires. <clears throat> So he would have had to go to London, and I've already mentioned that he went to London only rarely, and Cambridge uh, not very often either. Uh, so his opportunity to hear opera in particular would be restricted to those occasions. Uh, whether he ever heard the church music, I don't know. 
So Freud was clearly restricted in the repertoire to which he was able to listen. But it's clear, uh, despite that, from his correspondence, that he nevertheless formed very detailed opinions on music that he almost certainly hadn't heard. His letters contain critiques of operas, cantatas, and choral music, for example, by Boncini, Fossi, Jomelli, Josquin, Lotti, Marcello, Ockergen, Paziello, Palestrina, Pegalesi, Sacchini, and a number of others. So the question arises, how did he engage with music by those composers? And I think the answer is that he heard most of it in his head by a process of what I'm going to refer to as silent listening. Uh, I don't know of any other um, information about this, but there's a correspondence again between Twining and Burning where they discuss silent listening uh, and its limitations. And so here's the first letter of Twining to Burning in 1781. It says, You, from long habit, have your ear in your eye and can perhaps hear all the effects of complicated harmony by reading it. So can I tolerably in modern music and modern notation. But in this old church music, with its clefts, its points, its unobvious contrivances, its equally distributed melody that is everywhere and nowhere, its keyless modulation, and its discretion in supplement of flats and sharps, etc., in this music I can do nothing but a keyed instrument. And even so, I cannot with much readiness get through the harmony. Bernie replied six days later. <coughs> Bernie says, you think of the old stuff just as I wish, that, that is their opinions about 16th and 17th century choral music are similar. <coughs> I have scored them all and transcribed them for you without trial and effect, except in my mind's ear. But, as you very comically say, by long habit and experience, one's ear gets up into one's eye. My pianoforte is always so loaded with books and so out of tune that I have neither industry nor inclination to unload and put it in order for a momentary use. In other words, it couldn't be hard to clear the piano, you'd rather listen to it instead. <clears throat> now it's hard to say how well developed the skill of silent listening in earlier centuries compared with their own times, but uh, I suspect that the extent to which early musicians had to rely on it must have been much, much greater than it is now. The final constraint on listening that I want to discuss is quality, quality of performance. There can be no doubt that poor performances in the provinces had a detrimental effect on listening experiences. An account of the Colchester subscription concerts dating from the 1760s, I think, speaks for itself. It's an extract of a printed letter from a lady in Colchester to her friend in town. I must not omit to inform you of one thing that carries with it the appearance of gaiety and pleasure, which is an humble imitation of a concert here once a fortnight. A laughable burlesque affair, I assure you. Something inferior to the orchestra of a set of barn playing comedians, where two or three infamous tormentors of catgut, particularly from the neighborhood, neighborhood of Devon, meet together to amuse and entertain. The next paragraph, I think, is about the organizer of these. I wish, I say, someone would persuade him to a cheaper method of entertaining himself by procuring two or three young pigs, which might be dragged into his room by their tails, there to squeak with a book of concerto before them till his musical fit was over. This, I am convinced, would not only answer every purpose with respect to his ear, but, as there might be some got to squeaky in unison, so, so, so would it be far preferable than that jar of the sound produced by an unskillful draw of a harsh rosin bow across a bass fiddle. Thus much for our conscious amusements. Great quote. Um, obviously, it's a caricature, but it does have considerable ring of truth in it, insofar as many other accounts of provincial orchestral performances mention their poor quality, so consciously, I think, can be no exception. Chamber performances were also mixed. Largely because of varying standards of gentlemen players. I think this is an important theme. We've already heard of Twining's frustration at not. Ooh, did I, I? Sorry, I didn't give you the second answer that. I can't see the screen. Uh, give me a couple of minutes to enjoy that because it's worth it. <coughs> okay, just. 
just to keep in your head is the um, picture of some peaks in front of the concerto score to be recommended. Uh, anyway, to, to gentlemen players, uh, we've already heard of Twining's frustration of not being able to perform Boccherini's quintet because no suitable cellist was available. But later, in 1791, a gentleman moved into the area to solve the problem, and Twining's subsequent letter to Burley reveals a great deal about gentleman players in general. My friend Mr. Tyndall has come to settle, for the present at least, in this neighbourhood. He's going to succeed me in a curacy of Fordham, which is three or four miles from Cottesloe. He plays the fiddle well, the harpsichord well, the violoncello well. Now, sir, when I say well, I can't be supposed to mean the wellness that one should predicate of a professor who makes those instruments as study, but that he plays in a very ungentlemanlike manner. Exactly in tune of time, with the taste, accent of meaning, and a true sense of what he plays. And upon the violoncello, he has execution sufficient to play Boccherini's quintettos at least what may be called very decently. Now, the implication of that quote is that the typical gentleman usually played out of tune, out of time, with no taste or feeling. But Twining in Colchester, nevertheless, seems to have been reasonably fortunate in the sort of gentleman that he had around him. He says to Bernie, my friends are among the better sort of dilettante. He also comments specifically uh, on a Miss Marshall, a high quality peers, who was also able to cite me well, what he says to Bernie. I write this letter, and very willingly too, at the request of Miss Marshall, who will deliver it. She's going to town for a little while and thirst for music. She lives at Ipswich, where she hears nothing worth hearing but her own play. In contrast to his very local experiences, for Twining visits to London and to Cambridge, where he heard the best performers of the day, the professionals. In Cambridge, this was especially true in the summer months, when those musicians visited for a little while. Twining's experiences of London are particularly interesting because they emphasize the rarity and intensity of high-quality performance for those whose routine listening was mostly mediocre. First of all, then, a, a brief extract from a letter to Charles Jenner. Dear Jenner, I fully intended writing to you from the great city, he was in London, um, but know what a place the great city is, but you know what a, great, what a place the great city is, especially to a man who comes and stays there, staring with his mouth open for five minutes only, once in two years. On one rainy morning, I actually sat down to write to you, but was interrupted before I had finished the first sentence. And had I not been, I never could have gone on with such an unsettled, dissipated brain, full of Lovatini and Garrick and Piccini and Reynolds, etc., vibrating and quivering like a jelly. Another experience on a different occasion of London musical life. We dined with Bates one day and heard Miss Harrop sing from tea time till 10 o'clock, snug and comfortable. No audience but two Bateses, Mrs. Bates and ourselves. One of the greatest musical treats I ever had. I had, as Sir Hugh Evans says, great dispositions to cry. Nay, the tears actually came out, and Elsor, who was a friend, said he should have cried if he had not seen how foolish I looked. She sung Peg Lazy, Leo, Hassa, Things I Know, and Nobody Sings. It gave me some faint idea of meeting one's departed friends in heaven. So, in conclusion, then, the pinnacle of Twining's listening experiences was clearly what he heard in London. Colchester could rarely, if ever, match what he heard in the capital. For all its benefits, Colchester was just too small to offer the breadth of quality, breadth or quality of London's listening experiences. In a pre-recording era, even an enterprising provincial musician such as Coyne usually had to settle the second best. This is 